Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancy. Tonight, sorrow acknowledged, but still missing an apology. I think it's just a really sad day. The Pope says Canada has been traumatized, but after a chorus of voices call for an apology for residential schools, it doesn't come. It's inadequate. Plus, a Canadian cardinal pushes back to the Prime Minister after he urges the church to release any documents. I think those are extremely unhelpful remarks by Mr. Trudeau. Also tonight, how close are we to kicking COVID? Second shot rollout ramps up as more of the country reopens. My God, it's like crazy. Why some doctors are still prescribing caution. Megan and Harry welcome Lily. The special tributes paid in the names of the newest royal baby. And from the tragically hip to honoring Canadian hip hop, the highlights of the 50th Juno Awards, this is the national. For years, people have been calling on the Pope to apologize for the role of the Roman Catholic Church in residential schools. Today, Pope Francis showed he was listening, but he did not answer the call. Di 215 bambini alunni della Camlops Indian Residential School. As you could hear, he specifically mentioned the Kamloops Indian Residential School, where search has revealed what's believed to be the remains of 215 children. Francis expressed his, quote, closeness to the Canadian people traumatized by the shocking news, but did not apologize. Both Indigenous leaders and the Prime Minister had pushed hard for an apology over the last week. They also want any residential school records the church has released. As Rafi Bujikanian explains, that led to some pushback today from a Canadian cardinal. I don't know whether the seeking always some big and uh, dramatic thing is really the way forward. Today, Cardinal Thomas Collins, Archbishop of Toronto, downplayed the need for a papal apology, despite Indigenous leaders and Canadian politicians asking for one for years. Move forward on apologizing. Those calls intensified last week, with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau also urging the church to release any residential school documents. Before uh, we have to start taking the Catholic Church to court, uh, I am very hopeful uh, that uh, religious leaders uh, will understand. Today on Rosemary Barton Live, Collins took issue with it all. No one that I know of is trying to hide records. I think those are extremely unhelpful remarks by Mr. Trudeau and uh, uninformed. The federal government hit back. That it's unhelpful for the cardinal to call the prime minister's remarks unhelpful. Documents from the Catholic order that ran the Kamloops residential school are being scoured by archivists. And earlier this week, the Vancouver Archbishop committed to sharing the records it has related to all residential schools. The former National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations had this to say about the Cardinal today. He's a holy man. I'm sure he wouldn't lie, but he can fudge the truth a little bit. Phil Fontaine is also a residential school survivor. He says there is a lot that's still hidden. There are records yet to be accessed in different parts of the country. Our elder wants to... In 2009, Fontaine met with former Pope Benedict, who didn't say sorry either. There ought to be a full apology from the Holy Father. The Roman Catholic Church operated up to 70% of residential schools. The rest were run by United, Anglican and Presbyterian churches. They have all issued apologies. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. We will dive into the issue of church and government records, including key documents that were lost or destroyed and some revealing documents shared with CBC News later in the hour. On the issue of a formal apology, today former Senator Murray Sinclair, who also chaired the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, said it's a first step the Catholic Church cannot skip. They want to go straight to redemption in the sense that they want to be <clears throat> freed from any further uh, acknowledgement of my ability or responsibility without having, in fact, admitted that he did anything wrong. He called that inadequate and said an apology was necessary in a reconciliation process that would be taken seriously. So the big question is, why didn't Pope Francis apologize today? 
The CBC's Megan Williams has covered the Vatican extensively and explains what a Canadian cardinal told her today. Pope Francis met yesterday with the two Canadian cardinals who live here in Rome, Cardinal Mark Willett and Cardinal Michael Cherney. He met with them separately, and Vatican observers say it's highly unusual for the Pope to meet with both of these cardinals on the same day, and it was very likely that the topic of their conversation was the discovery of the remains of the children in the residential school run by the Catholic Church in Kamloops. Right after Pope Francis made his comments in St. Peter's Square this morning, I spoke on the phone with Canadian Cardinal Michael Cherney and I asked him why Pope Francis had not apologized and he told me that that wasn't a priority right now. What the Pope's priority was, was responding to the situation unfolding in Canada right now, namely to what he said uh, was the pain pain, the dismay and the hurt. He also said that the Pope wanted to encourage the Canadian Catholic Church to uh, respond to the situation, the Canadian bishops, uh, perhaps for them to issue a, a formal apology first. Interestingly, uh, Michael Cherney said he thought the Pope had apologized to uh, Indigenous people in Canada, that that was part of an apology the Pope made several years ago in Bolivia when he apologized to the Indigenous people of the Americas, meaning both North America and South America. Of course, a lot of Canadians aren't going to see it that way, but that is uh, the response right now from the Catholic Church here in Rome. Megan Williams in Rome tonight. The absence of an apology is also colouring the growing memorials to children who never return from residential schools. The disappointment mixing with the grief of Canadians, Catholics and non-Catholic alike. Barry Stewart shows us how the country is paying tribute. In Brandon, Manitoba, 215 crosses are being staked into the ground. Written on them the names of some who went to residential school personal connection to a deeply disturbing history. I can't imagine my kids being taken, you know, like, and I know there's so many others that feel the same way. Across the country, people are continuing to mourn and remember. Yesterday in Kamloops, truck drivers rallied in solidarity outside of the city's former residential school, where a memorial grows. In BC's Peace Arch Park, an international ceremony hosted by the Lummi Nation. Relatives of those who went to the Kamloops Residential School were given ceremonial blankets. Organizers wanted to recognize the suffering of Indigenous people from colonial policies across borders. I hope that this sheds light on what happened not only in Canada but in the US and Australia. Those three countries were uh, the ones that committed these atrocities against the natives. In recent days there's been a growing push for accountability both from the federal government and the Catholic Church which is why some were disappointed to not receive an apology from the Pope today. I think it's just a really sad day for, you know, folks who may be survivors and follow that faith that, you know, it is, uh, I think, extremely disrespectful. As people marched in Toronto with banners that read, Bring Our Children Home, work was underway in Nova Scotia to search for any remains buried near which was once the Shubenacadie Residential School. At least 16 children were known to have died there. We spoke the truth, and now the truth is, is coming forth. The hope is that it leads to more searches at former residential school sites across the country. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. A statue of Egerton Ryerson, one of the chief architects of the residential school system, has been brought down. The statue at Toronto's Ryerson University was toppled earlier tonight after a demonstration to remember residential school victims. It had been covered in paint and protest graffiti for days. It's not clear who did it. Turning to the COVID-19 story now, the last few months of the pandemic have often been described as a race between variants and vaccines. And recently Canada has started to pull ahead, but preventing another surge means keeping up the pace. When the third wave peaked in mid-April, less than a quarter of the country's population had at least one shot. Now that protection covers more than 61% of the population. Provinces are stepping up second doses, but just 7% of Canadians are fully vaccinated. And a single dose isn't enough protection 
especially against some of the variants. The variant first identified in India, now known as Delta, is thought to be more contagious than other strains. And Talia Ricci shows us that is adding urgency to the vaccine rollout in some hotspots. A second round of relief for thousands this weekend. A little stiff on the shoulder, but other than that, great. Feels good. And for many, dose two is coming sooner than expected. Actually, the second one was booked uh, for end of July, July 31st, actually. And my son sent me a link yesterday. Well, there you go. And Health officials in Peel, a hotspot west of Toronto, say there's an urgent need to get second doses out faster. We know that two-dose coverage uh, is really critical to ensuring protection against uh, the Delta variant that is uh, rapidly uh, becoming the dominant variant in Peel. Ontario's COVID-19 science advisory table estimates that the Delta variant already represents 27% of new cases province-wide. One shot may not cut it. It's only 33 to 50 percent effective. On Friday, the province expanded second dose eligibility ahead of schedule. Now that we've increased it to the 70 plus and plus everybody April 18th and before had their first doses, it's actually super exciting because now we're seeing a ton of people come out. The focus has shifted to second doses across the country. In BC, most people in the province will now be able to receive their second dose two months after their first instead of four. And hard hit Manitoba rapidly expanded eligibility last week. But with just a fraction of Canadians fully vaccinated and reopening plans playing out in several provinces, doctors say don't let your guard down. We want to make sure that we are, you know, not putting ourselves in situations where we all crowd onto a beach and we're all standing, you know, shoulder to shoulder with each other. That's actually how these things actually start to spread. Which means sticking to public health measures and getting into lineups like this one. So we can enjoy the summer ASAP, you know. <laughs> and stay ahead of the virus right to the finish line. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Quebec is also moving up its second dose program, and tomorrow those over 80 can book their second shot, and everyone over 18 will have a much shorter wait between doses. This as public health restrictions in former hotspots Montreal and Laval are set to lift. Matt Damore shows us how it feels to be emerging from the lockdown. Yeah. A limited capacity crowd at the Bell Centre cheering on the Habs as they lead this playoff round. For fans, it's an exciting time. I'm a Canadian fan so not, since I've been five years old, so uh, I, I watch every game. We came earlier to meet the players, greet the players as they uh, drove in and walked in, and uh, it was pretty cool. Even off the ice, there is cause for excitement across the province as the COVID situation improves. Today, Quebec recorded no new deaths from the coronavirus and 179 new cases. It's the first time daily cases have dropped below 200 since back in September. The milestone comes a little over a week after an overnight curfew was lifted and outdoor dining got the green light. We were closed something like around one year in the last 15 months. So it's a lot, of, yeah, of course it's a fresh air. And for the Montreal Canadian, my God, it's like crazy. We, we didn't have that since a while. Something else Montreal hasn't seen in a while, more than eight months, is indoor dining. It's coming back tomorrow with some restrictions, along with gyms reopening. Dr. Christopher Labo says that given the trends, Quebecers have a reason to be optimistic. But... That doesn't mean that things can't change in the future. And so if people don't have some degree of self-restraint and don't practice a bare minimum of you know public health safety measures we could see things worsen a note of caution as quebecers start to see more of that light at the end of the tunnel matt Damoul, cbc news montreal some news today for whoever wins the North Division. The federal government has approved a travel exemption for NHL players crossing the border for the final two rounds of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Players and team staff can bypass the usual two weeks of isolation. They will have to enter Canada on private planes and they'll live in a modified bubble and be subject to a daily test for COVID-19. Turning now to a story you'll be especially interested in if you've ever received money electronically. A Vancouver woman is going public after $1,600 vanished from her account. And it turned out the bank didn't have to tell her why. Erica Johnson investigates. She's selling for about $25,000. $25,000 yeah. for this bag. People will pay that. 
Angel Pui is giving the lowdown on high-end designer handbags. Fashion houses like Hermes, Chanel and Gucci make limited editions. Everyone is chasing after the same unicorn as they call it. A handbag fan herself, she started a business last year selling some of those hot ticket items for a profit. A buyer in Korea sent $1,600 for a Gucci bag using an electronic funds transfer from bank account to bank account. But a month later, Pui noticed the money was gone. I just didn't understand what was happening. I just felt this sense of shock. She called her online bank, Tangerine. Finally, you can see where your money's going. But all they could tell her was a bank in Korea had requested a payment recall and Tangerine allowed it. They should at least tell me about it, hear my side of the story. She emailed her buyer, got no reply, wrote her bank too, several times, no response. Payment reversals are a common problem, says this expert. And as more businesses move online in the pandemic, she says, the problem is growing. When you hit a brick wall and you don't even know why the money's been withdrawn again, that's incredibly frustrating. Transparency is something that's always desirable and it's just a part of good customer service. But it's all allowed, says the ombudsman. For instance, in cases of possible fraud or money laundering, thanks to the fine print in most bank account agreements. Usually they have language in them that gives the bank a lot of scope for how to handle these type of cases. Tangerine's terms say deposits or withdrawals from your account may be reversed and it may change the requirements for transferring funds at any time. After GoPublic got involved, Tangerine gave its customer her money back but still wouldn't tell her or us what happened. Angel Pui says she's learned an important lesson. Banks can reverse a deposit with no clear explanation. Why? Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. The world found out today about the latest royal arrival. The Duchess of Sussex has delivered a daughter. There aren't any pictures yet, though. And as Susan Ormiston explains, the new baby carries a weighty royal name as the family's rift continues. She's born and her name, Lilibet Diana, tells a story. Lilibet for her great-grandmother, Queen Elizabeth. Her nickname as a child, her father, King George, called her that. Prince Philip did too, and when he died, the Queen's note to him was signed, Lilibet. The baby's second name, Diana, in memory of Harry's mother, who died when he was just 12. So two deeply personal royal names, perhaps a peace offering after a year of royal rifts. There's a conversation it. with you. With Harry. About how dark your baby is going to be? Potentially, and what that would mean or look like. Ooh. That was Meghan's stunning revelation in March. Harry refused to identify who said it. That conversation, <laughs> I'm never going to share. Prince William, he was tight-lipped about his brother's interview. Sir, have you, broke, have you spoken to your brother since the interview? <laughs> no, I haven't spoken to him yet, but I will do. I'm very much not a racist fan. Prince Philip's funeral brought the two brothers together, but tensions remain as Harry and Meghan and Archie navigate a new life in California with podcasts, books and documentaries. The results of this year will be felt for decades. For kids. Harry co-producing a TV series on mental health, admitting that Meghan encouraged him to dig into his own anger over his mother's death. And I quickly established that if this relationship was, was going to work, that I was going to have to deal with my past. A new baby, perhaps a bridge between then and now. William and Kate saying they're absolutely delighted about baby Lily's birth. The Queen, Prince Charles and Camilla adding their congratulations. The newest Windsor was actually born Friday in Santa Barbara, but not announced until today on Harry and Meghan's website, a sign that they can and they will control news about their family on their terms. Lilibet Diana is by birth a U.S. citizen and now eighth in line to the British throne. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. The Juno Awards are celebrating 50 years, and tonight they're putting on a show fit for the times. This year's awards are a blend of fresh faces made famous by TikTok and the Canadian trailblazers that paved the way. Let your backbone slide. 
and a new, more transmissible variant is showing up in parts of Canada. Does it put the country's long-awaited reopening at risk? Our doctors weigh in with the facts. Plus, records obtained by CBC News uncover how some children died at the Kamloops Residential School. Those were warnings that were given to us as little tiny children, five, six years old. Survivors speak about those who never made it home. Stay with us. From established stars to breakthrough talent tonight, the 50th annual Juno Awards, a major milestone for Canadian music at an important moment for both musicians and the industry. These are the first Junos to be awarded during the pandemic, and that's having an impact not just on the show, but the music itself. Eli Glasner has been following the awards, the performances, and Eli, what did you think? You know, it's been interesting, Ian. I mean, as you say, like, this is a tribute to 50 years of Canadian music, this evolving sounds of our country now challenged by the pandemic. You can't even gather to cheer on your favorite artists for an encore. But I think what we got was a great mixture of performance performances and winners beginning with Justin Bieber performing kicking off the show in a fresh haircut he took home the uh, best Juno for pop album of the year now the weekend was the real big winner so that's Bieber performing with the weekend led in nominations going into the show uh, even though the Grammys missed their chance to uh, award him uh, Juno's did just fine he took home five Junos overall for his album After Hours, including Album of the Year, Artist of the Year, presented by Shania Twain. And then we had to close out this show, this beautiful performance by the Tragically Hip, introduced by members of Rush, so from one kind of legendary group to another. A lot of uh, talk of Gord Downey, uh, missing Gord, and uh, speaking of what he's done for Indigenous issues in this country. And then we got to see the remaining remaining band members of the Tragically Hip perform with Juno winner Feist herself doing It's a Good Life If You Don't Weaken. Take a look. I gotta say though, I think one of my favorite moments was the tribute to Canadian hip hop history. Uh, wonderful to see all of these artists gathered together. And of course, you can't talk about uh, hip hop in Canada with talking about the godfather of rap himself, Maestro Fresh West, still going, still making those backbone slide. Here he is in action. This jam was amplified, so just glide. Let your backbone slide. There you go. You know, there wasn't even a rap category before Maestro Fresh West came along in 1991 when he first won for his album. And he talked about then it being a really important moment for black music in Canada. And he looked tonight, history being made, Wonder Girl making uh, history as the first black woman to win producer of the year, uh, Katri winning for dance recording. So really seeing the industry uh, making strides tonight. Eli, the 2020 award show was cancelled. What kind of impact from the pandemic are you seeing? Well, Ian, with the closure of so many of those music venues, musicians need to find new ways to connect. And increasingly, they're connecting on TikTok. You look at the breakthrough music category. Three of the nominees went viral on TikTok. Tate McRae, Poe Fu, and Curtis Waters. We also had a performance from J.P. Sachs. You come over right his song, If the World Was Ending, is inescapable on TikTok. And we even got an appearance by the Basement Gang, who are also doing very well on that same app. Next year, I hope you're at the Junos, not at home. Thanks, Eli. That would be great. Thank you. Next on The National, there's a growing number of calls to improve how kids are taught history. It is marginally better in the fact that residential schools are actually touched on, but it is not by any means thorough or taught appropriately. Many districts have only recently started teaching about residential schools, and some say the curriculum needs work. Plus... Children were buried in unmarked graves uh, adjacent to the schools. Survivors recount 
horrific stories at the Kamloops Residential School and give clues to how some children may have died. Stay with us. Canada is grappling, perhaps like never before, with the inhumane treatment of Indigenous children at residential schools. The news from Kamloops devastating, but survivors of residential schools say this was no secret. Canadians should have believed this. Now they have uh, an opportunity to accept what we've been saying as the truth. Tonight, we examine why that history has not been widely taught and how some progress is being made. But on a day when the Pope fell short of apologizing for what happened at the hands of Catholic orders, we begin at that Kamloops school. Jorge Barrera leads a CBC News investigation with an in-depth look at what students went through and how the church may hold several keys to reconciliation. It brings me back to a time in my life, my time when, it, when I lived in peace and comfort and safety and I felt protected by my family. And, uh, excuse me, that was probably the safest time in my life. Barbara McNabb Larson still remembers the day it changed. And I remember when they came to get us from here the first year, we uh, went in a livestock truck. And the next year? They came out with a, uh, an army truck. And they drove us back to the school and these trucks, and they unloaded us like we were just little animals. She is one of thousands forced through the doors for nearly 80 years of Kamloops Residential School. The first things they did was they took us down to our cleansing room where they cut off our hair. Then they deloused us. Then they scrubbed us down with disinfectant like we were diseased animals. Sorry. The name of the institution is now known worldwide. Students always suspected children were buried here, and now they are reliving the horror. For three days, I went into a depression so deep. And a grief that I never knew I had. No cross or stone and scarce information to mark who lies buried here. It's going to be Christmas and we want to get all ready for Christmas, don't we? The Catholic Order Sisters of St. Anne's taught at the school. We have knowledge of maybe about 20 children that died in the school over that 80-year period. Sister Marie Zeroni belongs to the order. So there is a hint in the records of another cemetery connected to the school, but we don't know where. I actually don't know if that reference comes from that school or from another school. At Canloops Residential School, the threat of death hung in the air. You better behave. Don't get out of line because there's the graveyard. And there's also the river. Those were warnings that were given to us as little tiny children, five, six years old. Death was real here. We do know how some of these children died. Records from the 1930s were shared with us. Leslie Lewis, nine-year-old boy, died from an epileptic seizure. The Indian agent filed a report noting the overcrowded conditions in the institution. During an epidemic, it is impossible to properly isolate the patient and contacts. The need for separate quarters to house sick children is evident. I wanted to go home and I was weeping. I remember there's a train whistle. The trains would go by Kamloops and I'd hear the whistle. And it became one of my triggers later on after I left a residential school. You know, I'll tell you the truth, that years of residential school was like a blur to me. The suicide, you know, I remember this young man, our young boy, hung himself in the bathroom. Still today, they remember that. They still get nightmares about it. 
and about the runaways and people jumping trains, getting killed, jumping a train, you know, freezing outside, running away in the wintertime. There was another girl, Florence Morgan, whose age is not noted, died from a viral infection. The Indian agent reported her body was returned home by truck. And that's one of the things about um, life lessons. Say, for example, uh, when you got the strap the first time, I sounded like a coyote howling and crying. Um, the second time, not much so than uh, the third time. I, uh, he wanted me to cry. And I said, I'm not going to cry. And I went and found a nice uh, spot where there was nobody around, and then I had to cry. Some never made it home. The girl's name was Mary Francois, age not noted. Died in hospital from a blood clot in her brain. Her father, chief of the Adams Lake Band, who only saw her after death, wrote a letter requesting when a child of the school is taken sick and requires hospital attention, that the parent be notified at once. The community gathered testimonials in this book. You're growing up, you're not allowed to do something. I wasn't allowed to read this book. That's Mike McKenzie reads a passage from survivor James Child. I walked along the river bank and I found that student floating in the water by the shore. His body was stiff. For finding that deceased person, I was strapped 150 times on each hand. I think there was a few times that happened. Mackenzie's father's story is also in here. My dad, Terry Denault, went to the, uh, we call him Shinny, and he went to the Kamloops Indian Residential School. We were so young, we didn't know where to turn for help. I was whipped so many times that eventually you get so tough that you block those things out and you can't feel things. That's how it was here. This oral history fills a gap between the still incomplete record of the residential school era. Many records were pulped by the federal government, including from Kamloops. Funeral records destroyed, Indian agent reports destroyed, student lists destroyed. Those records were not highly, um, highly valued in terms of being preserved uh, from, uh, you know, the, from, from the recycling process that went on. John Malloy, an author and historian who worked for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. A lot of that information was simply lost. He said Indian Affairs officials sometimes failed to record information. We report uh, abuse of these children to you when you don't do anything about it, and therefore we're not going to be bothered reporting to you any longer. The same lack of care accompanied the death of children. Children died, children were buried, uh, parents were not necessarily told that they had died. Children were buried in unmarked graves, uh, adjacent to the schools oftentimes. Death a part of life in residential schools. But there's one institution with key information still in the shadows. There were records kept by nuns and records kept by uh, priests um, and, and sort of diaries. And the claim was made that these were personal documents, right? Zeroni says a fire at the school destroyed the first 30 years of records. She said they have opened their archives to aid in the search. But as for letting outsiders sift through the more personal files, I, I would need to know what, what it is they're looking for. And no, we wouldn't just turn them all over. But the one history that can never be hidden is the one carried by those who came home. I call upon all our people across our Turtle Island, all of our First Nations. It doesn't matter whether you're a Mohawk or a Cree or a Dene or a Shuswap or a Kitkiskan. We're all one people. We're one nation, and it is our cultural and traditional strength, I believe, that has allowed us to carry on and to live. Jorge, Canadian Cardinal Thomas Collins and the Prime Minister seem to disagree over whether the church did hand over records from residential schools. What did your research show? Well, they're kind of both right. Most Catholic entities, including the Oblates who ran Kamloops Residential School, turn over records to the Truth and, and Reconciliation Commission. But about 17 didn't. What none of them turned over were personnel files, like priest discipline reports, 
transfers, diaries that itemize daily life in residential schools. And I've spoken to some who work for the TRC who say it's time to give an independent body subpoena powers to search all church archives in Canada. And why did the government of Canada destroy some of the records? Well, it was an issue of priorities. Indian Affairs prioritized records around land and band membership lists. So they, when they were faced with edicts to, to recycle paper because of paper shortages, they saw residential school records as expendable. But we don't even have an idea of what was lost because the government also destroyed files that described the records that were pulped. Thanks, Jorge. The National Indian Residential School Crisis Line is available if you need help. The number is on your screen and it's staffed. 24 hours. The news out of Kamloops has raised questions about how little some Canadians know about the traumatic legacy of residential schools. Here's Deanna Sumanag Johnson on the growing push to change that. Has school discussed anything that has happened in Kamloops? As an Indigenous person, Joy Henderson has known about residential schools her whole life, but she didn't learn about them in school, and she's not happy with how much her kids are learning. It is marginally better in the fact that residential schools are actually touched on, and so, but it is not by any means thorough or taught appropriately. Teaching kids about residential schools was one of the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission six years ago. Many classrooms across the country do include lessons about them now. But how effective this education is, is another question. Often it is glossed over because educators are worried about, you know, touching these traumatic topics. And so they're like, OK, well, here's residential schools. They were bad, but we're not going to get into the details sort of thing. Experts agree teaching the teachers is key. Larger school boards like the Toronto District School Board have special Indigenous education units where teachers can get help if they know where to look. Indigenous education is not tokenism. And this is something where the governments and the education sectors really need to prioritize to providing supports and learning opportunities for teachers to participate in. But change, though slow, is possible. In Nelson, BC, these two educators help their colleagues teach from the Indigenous perspective, from music and math to tougher subjects. Gail Higginbottom never learned about residential schools in class. Now she has met kindergartners who have. And I thought that is the change. This is an invitation for all learners, Indigenous and non-Indigenous learners here in BC to learn about the truth. The truth is how we will move towards reconciliation. Doing their best to make sure the future generations of Canadians are saddened but not surprised when confronted with the reality of residential schools. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, an emerging COVID-19 variant underlines the urgency of second shots. What's Canada's reopening plan? I speak with two doctors to get a dose of reality next. I'll come back with the variants, vaccinations and provincial reopenings in the news. We thought it was a good time to check in with two infectious disease specialists. Dr. Suman Chakrabarty joins us from Mississauga, Ontario, and Dr. Lenora Saxinger is in Edmonton. Welcome to both of you. Thanks. Good to be here. As we heard earlier in the show, some in Ontario are expressing concerns about the Delta variant of COVID. That's the one first detected in India. So, Dr. Chakrabarty, how do you think that will or should figure into Ontario's reopening plans? I think it's a factor for us to think about, obviously. This is something that's new and emerging and we should pay attention to it. That said, I think that we have to remember uh, in Ontario and Canada as a whole, we're in a fundamentally different position, having now you know, somewhere close to 70% vaccination across the country. This is very different than when the, the Alpha variant, the B117, was here a couple of months ago. So I do think that we need to be cautious, but at the same time remember that it's a very, very different situation. And I think overall, I don't think it's going to be as big of an impact, but it's important to watch out for it. Dr. Saxinger, reopening is happening at different paces across Canada. Alberta is ahead of where Ontario is right now. Um, is it possible that we'll see another spike and have to slow things down again? 
Of course, it's possible. I think that it's an open question because we also have seen increasing Delta variant. We also have seen um, pretty good vaccine uptake across large parts of the province, which should be protective. And we also have the good weather, which we think might modulate the, the transmission a little bit. And so monitoring closely is going to be very important. And I think other jurisdictions might be watching what's happening here to see if we're going to start to have more problems, honestly. Dr. Chakrabarty, what do we know about the vaccines that have been approved in Canada and their protection against the Delta variant? So looking at the vaccines, the main ones, uh, you know, that we look at here, the mRNA ones and also AstraZeneca, they do have uh, good efficacy after two doses of vaccine. It's somewhere in the uh, uh, close to 90 percent in terms of uh, overall uh, efficacy. There is a concern about uh, AstraZeneca with one dose uh, citing something like 33 percent efficacy. One thing I do want to point out, though, while that does seem quite low, on a population level, that could actually make quite a big difference. And also, we don't have the data yet about whether this is severe disease or not. And the uh, thought is that it's actually quite a bit more effective against severe disease and hospitalization. Either way, I think it's important that vaccines help, and we do need to continue to get people vaccinated, but it's going to protect us whether you have one or two doses. Not that I'm seeking a second opinion, but Dr. Saxinger, why don't you weigh in on the, the sort of uh, link between the vaccines uh, we have in Canada and the variants? Well, I think that the uh, the emergence of the Delta variant especially makes us really focus in on the dose two part of our push. So dose one push has been the focus. I think this brings dose two uh, necessity as a major highlight again. I think a lot of places are looking at accelerating dose two rollout as much as possible and really trying to make sure people come back for that. It also, also might figure into the second dose decisions of people who've received AstraZeneca for a first dose. Um, so there might be more interest, I think, in getting an mRNA vaccine for a second dose just because it might offer a better antibody level against that, although those data are still evolving as well. So people are having to make a decision in a situation where the information is still coming in. Yeah, th this is really challenging. In BC on Thursday, Dr. Henry, the provincial health officer, gave us all, I guess, a briefing on the fact that we could mix uh, and match between the two uh, doses. And a lot of people were emailing me saying, where does that leave us? What, what should we do? So Dr. Chakrabarty, pick up on what Dr. Saxinger said in terms of mixing and matching. What, what, what have you read on that? Yeah, it looks like the, the evidence for this, and it's not all that surprising that it probably does work. And in fact, there's a suggestion that you might even get some higher antibody levels uh, mixing in uh, data that's coming out of Spain and also uh, something coming out of Germany as well. Uh, overall, I think we do have a precedent for this with other vaccines. Uh, for example, uh, the pneumococcus vaccine that we put two different vaccines together and they give ex uh, you know an extra boost compared to if you use this two of the same one. Either way, immunologically, it makes sense. It could make sense uh, clinically as well. And I think now we have another option for us to do this for people in Canada. And Dr. Saxinger, let's finish uh, with the same topic we started with, that is the Delta variant and the concerns that uh, some people are raising, particularly in Ontario. And as you have a few times during this pandemic, you kind of look to the UK for, if not guidance, at least a sign of what might be ahead. That's right. I mean, they had the B117 variant become dominant before it became dominant here. They have actually used the same dosing schedule that we have with the delayed second dose to try to extend protection more broadly in that context. And now they're seeing actually a surge with uh, the Delta variant becoming dominant in the UK, but they're not necessarily seeing the same surge in hospitalizations. And so I think a lot of a lot of us are really watching what happens there, because although there's no crystal ball, that's the most relevant place for us to look at, and they really do provide excellent data. Um, so it's very much appreciated. Dr. Saxinger, Dr. Chakrabarty, always nice having you on the program. Thanks. Good to be here. Yeah. When we come back, finding musical ways to keep a community together during COVID. Oh, it just makes me so uh, heartwarming when I see them running just like a stampede. Our moment is next. When the COVID hit, People missed out on all our cultural events. When COVID hit, community gatherings became a lot harder, right? But this Manitoba Métis leader learned you can always take your act on the road. Bucky Anderson's music on the move is our moment. Well, when they hear the music, like we're in the, the, the homeland of the Métis, when they hear the music, the fiddle music, that's our Métis music. When the COVID hit, people missed out on all our cultural events, like Indigenous Day, Canada Day, Manitoba Day, Selkirk Fair and Rodeo. So I had that van sitting there and I got thinking, well, 
why don't I bring the music to the people? Oh, it just makes me so uh, heartwarming when I see them running just like a stampede, like a magnet, eh? and they're all trying to dance. <laughs> and they're waving and they all call me by name. Like today we made the whole realm. We went from the daycare, started off in the daycare, then we went to the schools, the juniors, then we went to junior high, then we ended up at the comp, and then we did the elders. And the feedback is all the same, it's all positive. Second like episode is still standing. Expect to see the host, Johnny Harris, is it, to pop out from uh, behind the van there. Um, apparently that van has become, the, here's the description the producer gave me, Selkirk famous. And, uh, and Buddy gets paid uh, sometimes actually money, but also uh, cookies sometimes, and he thinks that that is, uh, you know, more than enough. And uh, so there you go, celebrating Métis music in Manitoba. That is the National for June the 6th. Good night. <laughs>